thank you so very much. And um, yes, I, I kind of I was brought up a Buddhist, and I um, I wish I had have kept my the, the first time I ever tried to take notes with um, with Lama Yeshi. And uh, I think I was there at a teaching, I was 10 years old and I managed to write one and a half lines before I just became totally overwhelmed. Um, so yeah, I've, I was brought up a Buddhist and uh, I've been the SPC at, here at Lungri Tungpa Centre in Brisbane for about 24 years. Um, and uh, so yeah, I'm just trying to shove everything I possibly can into today's class. Huge welcome to the American students. I'm very excited to be hosted by another centre. And um, it's Geshe Sherab Centre. And I'm so thrilled Geshe Sherab is so beloved here when he comes to teach. Um, also welcome to the Australian students. Uh, it's wonderful to share some of this ritual stuff with you as well. Um, and we can all make international Dharma friends. So um, today's topic, the why have an altar? And um, I thought I'd start with, you know, if you remember back in the days when we used to go traveling, you know, and if you've been a tourist and you've gone into a temple or um, into a church and sometimes they have to sign saying, this is a, a living church, not a tourist attraction. Um, and it's because the actual, you know, the practitioners, the devotees, when they when they go, all the tourists umming and ahhing and being all disrespectful, but, um, Often they'll have the practitioners in the centre and all the tourists go around the outside. And um, so when we go to these places, like why do we even go as a tourist? It's to be inspired and changed. And when we think about our own altar, our altar too is a living practice. It's not just um, an interior decoration thing, although it's, you know, the more beautiful it is, the more inspired we are. Um, it's not a chore. It's not something that we have to feel guilty about. Oh, I really should have an altar, but you know, I've just ran out of energy. Um, it's a it's a living practice. It's a living process that we can really engage in, and it's like having a bit of biofeedback about how we're going in our life because it's an expression of our inner reality. So, in terms of you know, not being judgmental about it, but just actually learning about yourself because it is a feedback mechanism. The main thing about an altar, the, the altar, setting up an altar isn't the practice. The altar is a reminder of the practice. So whenever we see the altar, then we're reminded, oh yeah, this is what I'm aspiring to. And, and we all need reminders, right? So it's a memory prompt. What our goals are, what we're trying to become, um, remind us of the, all the universal qualities of the Buddha, it's, um, it connects us with that really deep meaning that it's so easy to get distracted from. So some of you might already have an altar. Some of you might have thought about it and ran out of energy. Um, some of you might be going to Dharma centers and wondering what are all those mysterious objects up there on the altar. So hopefully we'll be able to demystify some of those uh, today. The main thing about having an altar is it's a way to accumulate merit. So we need merit. We need stores and stores and stores of merit, which is like spiritual energy or spiritual fortune to be able to develop and progress on the path. Um, you know, you might think it's a, a little bit quaint maybe uh, or just like a cultural thing um, or even some people get um, quite uncomfortable thinking it's like worshipping idols or, you know, being a Buddhist isn't about what's out there. It's about what's within your heart. So actually the way that we can think about an altar is that it's like a mirror. It's a mirror of our qualities. And especially whenever we look at a Buddha statue, when, when we look at it, it's not just a Buddha statue out there, but any resonance that we have with that statue is because something is connecting with that from within us. So it is a mirror of our potential. What we're looking at is ourselves in the future as a Buddha. So what we'll have a look at is the essential components of what goes on an altar um, so that you can feel really confident to set your own up and get excited about the whole process, where to put it, how to arrange it. And I wanted to say a little bit about the power of holy objects, the power of place. 
So we've got about, um, I don't know, 40 minutes of the presentation and then uh, at least 20 minutes to be able to have um, question and answer and discussion. So if you've got questions, you can type them into the chat. Um, if you, um, at the end of the presentation, if you wanted to ask the questions in person, we can do that as well. So um, I'm just going to get our screen share up and um, also wanted to set the motivation. So I just like to set a motivation, really simple. The Buddhist motivation, as many of you would have heard with Venerable Ravina, the two wings of the bird, compassion and wisdom. So we can think uh, with, a, with an approach of curiosity and kindness. So curiosity, the wisdom side, kindness, the compassion side. There we have the two wings of the bird. Okay, so here's our screen share. The Dharma toolkit. <laughs> and uh, yes, everything starts with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. So we're going to start with His Holiness. This beautiful picture, His Holiness at home. And you know, if it's good enough for His Holiness to have an altar, then it's good enough for us too, isn't it? And um, I mean, I'm sure this photo was staged, but also you can just see that it's uh, it's not ostentatious, but it's beautiful. And you can see immediately it's a sacred space. So, um, you know, how, how does it work? How, how come having an altar works or what, what's the, the science behind it? So I thought I'd just start with this, the most kind of esoteric or, um, or, or philosophical part at the beginning. If you've done Buddhist teachings and have heard of the, the four Buddha bodies or, or the, the Dharmakaya and the Rupakaya. So the Dharmakaya, the mind of a Buddha, the great Dharmakaya. Wherever a Buddha is, which is everywhere, the Buddha's mind is everywhere, not separate from the Buddha's body. So that means the Buddhas are here all the time without obstruction. But how often do we remember that? So the altar is a reminder that the Buddhas are here with us all the time. They love us. Their sole purpose is to help us. So from the, from the, the great Dharmakaya, the Buddha's mind, then the expression of that is the Buddha's body. And so the, the subtle body, the Sambhogakaya, the body of light, the, um, the, the body that uh, teaches in the pure lands, uh, that uh, is, I suppose you could say, eternal because it can't degenerate. But, you know, for us mere mortals, we, it's difficult for us to connect with that Sambhogakaya body of light, the rainbow body. How many of us get to see Tenrezik in person or Manjushri in person? We just see pictures. So the Buddha statues are the Namanakaya aspect for us. So we have a statue of physical form made of metal or wood or concrete or gold. And that's the, the Namanakaya form, the form that we can relate with. But for a re realized being, like for someone like His Holiness the Dalai Lama or Lama Zorib Rinpoche, when they see a statue, they don't just see a metal statue, they actually see the Sambhogakaya form, the actual Buddha, the actual Tenrezik, the actual Tara. So um, I'll tell you a little story. When um, when Lamzo from Shea came to Tenrezik Institute a while ago, and um, and as he was going up the stairs to the throne, to sit on the throne, you know, he pauses halfway up the stairs and very intently looks at the altar. And he looked at the Tara statue, life-size Tara statue there for a very long time. And it was like Tara and, and um, Lama Zorib Rinpoche were having a conversation. It was so intense. And then he turned around and he said to one of the nuns, the Tara, Tara needs new clothes. And it was as if Tara had gone, hi, Rinpoche, look at me. <laughs> and what had happened, of course, all of the, the beautiful brocades had um, metal thread in them and it all tarnished because it's the tropics. 
the last like three months and suddenly all that gold goes turns to grungy black and green and there's Tara in this grungy black and green no gold no sparkles no nothing and love is over having this conversation so you know you could you could just about see that happening so so our llamas they they sometimes you you see they're listening and and who they're listening to is the buddhas the actual the actual holy beings right there that we just relate to with the statues also when Lama Zoe um, you know gives someone a, a statue uh, he'll often say oh this one wants to come with you so you know this 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 Manjushri has had said to Rinpoche oh, I want to go with that one so then he gives it to you Okay, so now back to the screen chair. How come all so beautiful and elaborate? Well, here we have the queen in all her regalia. You know, I like to start with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, but I also like to start with something a little bit left of center and risque. So if we met the queen like this in her palace, with all of the robes and the big heavy crown and things, you know, you might be a bit intimidated or at least you'd be very, very polite. Um, but if we met the queen, you know, in her undies at the pool, it's just like a nice old lady. So this, is, this kind of shows it's all in the framing. And rather than just use that to dismiss it, we can actually use the power of dependent arising of the framing to help us. So when we have an altar, for instance, here's one, it's a little bit out of focus, but um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a Christian church and um, it's just drop dead amazing. You know, it's three stories of, of, of guilt and gold and the saints and you can't help but be moved by the magnificence of it. Here's a Buddhist one. Um, I think this is somewhere, it might be near where in near Lumbini. Um, it's a round temple and the ceiling is a vaulted ceiling with um with the sky and this uh incredible uh Vajradhara throne. I think it's a Kagi center, and really the magnificence of it. Um, inspires us so it, it, it reminds us about the, the might and the gravitas of the practice everything that we do is framed in life isn't it I mean we with weddings you have them in a big in a big place to show the importance when we have barbecues we set everything out you know perfectly all all the bits and pieces in the garden to make it a real party when you have a school graduation also there's all the pomp and ceremony there's something important about the framing. When we have guests to our house, you clean up beforehand, you make offerings to them, you have cocktail parties or whatever. So why not clean up for Buddha? Why not make offerings to Buddha and actually give, give due where due is worth it? So the beauty of an altar kind of reflects the wealth of the Dharma. That's what it's for. To, to kind of put things into perspective for us. And if the Dharma is the most important thing to us in our life, then somehow we have to express that as well. Um, so of course, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he, he says, don't be ostentatious. You know, there's something quite wrong about having say, a very, very rich temple surrounded by, by poverty and paupers. So that's not right. But if we have the means to do it, at least we um, can be consistent in our life. So here's, um, here's a picture of the Lungri Tungpa Center altar. Uh, so one of them, you can kind of get an idea when um, Geshe Siltram uh, was coming to teach. And then we have our um, cutout, pop-up cutout of Lama Zoprimbiche on the throne that if people haven't brought their spectacles with them, have said at the end, oh, who's the very quiet gentleman on the throne? <laughs> so... Um, it's so nice to have Rinpoche there on his throne. On the on the picture on the left, you can also see that we don't have in in the in the cabinet there with the Buddha statue. We don't have one of those 
uh, canopies, we've got a chandelier canopy because uh, I was inspired by the chandeliers at Copan. Uh, and we've got some pop-out drawers and things. So, you know, the, the, the power of place is, is important. And if you ever get a chance to go to an actual Dharma center, um, please take the, take the opportunity because when you go into that place, the, the power of the holy objects, it's different from ordinary objects. And we'll go into that in a moment of why, but you'll know you come into this place and you know it's a sacred space. And you, and you feel like you've walked into a pool of calm. And I know for me, it takes ages for all the bits and pieces to appear to me. I'm quite overwhelmed by it. We associate so many things with the power of place. If you've ever, um, you know, had an argument or broken up with someone, often the restaurant that you broke up in or something, you can never go back again because it's associated with trauma. We associate so much with the power of place. And so with a, with a temple or a Dharma center or your own altar, you can build all these positive associations and all you have to do is just turn your attention to it and immediately you're inspired, you have energy. So what, a, what a, an altar has are representations of a Buddha's body, speech and mind. And then the photos of the gurus, and then a range of offerings. So whether it's a temple like this or whether it's just a little shelf in your own house, you can have all the components of an altar right there. So what makes the, the power of place important uh, as well as having the holy objects there, the power of those objects that every time we even glance in that direction or every time we make just offer a flower, we create huge amounts of merit. Just walking into a Dharma center, casting your eyes over and bowing, you make skies of merit. Of course, what also makes a Dharma center so important is the kindness of everybody there because the center isn't the physical building, but the people and the, the practice, the practitioners there. And so we all kind of relate to that too. A Dharma center um, and maybe yourself also you have consecrated statues where the formal ceremony of inviting the Buddhas to reside in those statues so our statue actually isn't consecrated yet all of the the mantras and everything that are supposed to go in it are in the cupboard underneath so it's kind of proximity but we haven't quite got there yet um, and also the power of place accumulates over time especially if you go on pilgrimage those holy sites years and years of practitioners um, arriving there um, creates a power as well and so your own altar can create a power like that as well it's not a matter of belief animals experience it toddlers and children experience it um, and it's also of course it's not just buddhist altars but when i went overseas to many of the um, churches uh, in europe you, you walk in and you have a real feeling um, and especially the the uh, the statues to, to the Virgin Mary and the little uh, altars to Virgin Mary. Sometimes I felt they were like green Tara and other times I felt uh, they were like white Tara. So I'd be there saying my Tara prayers and everyone thought I was just, you know, doing the rosary. <laughs> so let's have a look then how to actually build the components of an altar. What do we put on there? So first off, the Buddha statue in the middle or a picture of the Buddha, a photograph, uh, but the, the form of the Buddha should be in the middle because this is what we're aiming towards, to transform ourselves into a Buddha. Um, so sometimes you might have the other components of an altar and you might just put the biggest thing in the middle and the smaller things on the edges to look aesthetically pleasing, but actually we've got to go with the meaning of it. So the Buddha in the middle, even if you have other um statues like tantric statues tara or chenrezig they go in a hierarchy around the buddha but the buddha goes in the middle um, or uh buddha vajradhara in the middle the tantric aspect of the buddha uh, or you can have a tanka of the buddha and then the statues in front but um in terms of the the inner architecture the buddha the buddha in the center and then um to the right of the Buddha, 
so our left all of the texts and uh this represents the speech the holy speech so you can have a tibetan text wrapped up you can have flashcards you can have the Heart Sutra wrote, it, wrote out in, you know, calligraphy, oldie worldy text in a frame, whatever you like. Um, usually a Wisdom Sutra and you usually actually wrap it up in a kata, a white scarf. So that's the, the, the teaching, the, the holy speech of the Buddha. If you're lucky enough to have um, the Kangu and the Tengu or maybe on a CD or something, you put that there. Then... On the other side, on our right, the stupa, and that represents the mind, the mind of a Buddha. Uh, so if you have a stupa that sits on your altar, if you don't have a stupa, you can have a, um, a Dogian bell. The bell in particular also um, represents the mind of a Buddha. Um, and uh, that also, it's nice to have wrapped in a kata if you can. Then at the top, the gurus. So because nothing's higher than the gurus. So His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Um, or if you don't have room, then in the front. So you can have it radial, radial. But what we're doing, the hierarchy trains our mind. Then offerings of light. So whether you have tea lights, I personally wouldn't have a naked flame. I like the electric ones because we don't want to have an auspicious purification of the building burning down. So uh, so tea lights, offering of light, even if you just come into your room and you switch the light on. Then water bowl offerings. Uh, so we'll, do, we'll talk about offerings next week, but the water bowl offerings is usually seven. Um, any type of bowl, I like crystal ones personally. Um, or if you have a daily practice commitment where you do a self-generation, then you have the tantric offerings. And then any other offerings that you can, flowers, preferably um, fresh flowers or fake flowers, but not dried flowers. Dried flowers is like, um, you know, it's kind of dead, so it's, it's no good. So I checked and it, plastic's fine, <laughs> but feng shui wise, not really dried flowers. With the Buddha statue, um, it's really good to train our mind that whether it's made of plastic or wood or gold, that we have a, uh, equal reverence. Uh, because, and even if a statue is quite rough, we can't say, oh, oh that's, that's not a very good Buddha <laughs> because Buddha's always good. And you can't say, oh, that's a beautiful Buddha because be Buddha's always beautiful. So what you can say is that statue is quite artistically accomplished. And we have to really train our speech so that we train our mind. So we recognize actually what we're relating to, even though we can't see the Buddha, or at least I know I can't see the Buddha right there in front of me made with a body of light. I'm connecting with the Buddha through this statue. And it's not about the statue. It's about the Buddha. And, and so training, training our mind to, to just have the reverence for the, for the meaning. So here's a photo of the, the little gompa at Lundry Tungpa Centre. And um, so it's the altar that I set up for our uh, New Year's Eve all night Tara Puja. And so the, the, the lower level is like a pop-up part with the, with the tantric offerings. We've got up and goes because Tara is pretty up and go. So that's the offering. And then the world because it was for the world. Uh, the all night Tara candle there. The... Um, the Tara Mandala. So usually I have it in a Mandala house, but because it was online, um, we had a very minimal altar and the rest of the altar was the screen share online as pixels of light, which I always find quite moving. So, you know, it's okay to have a little cardboard card uh, as, as the Mandala. Um, the, the V8, the Vajra 8 <laughs> offering to the guru. Uh, the gurus at the top here, you can kind of see. And the whole altar is just on a 1910s um, beautiful cabinet. And um, behind the Buddha, uh, the Buddha statue here is this mirror that I just put a gold doily on. So then we have this beautiful aura for the Buddha. So you can kind of see you, 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 you go along in a creative way. 
you take the elements um, and you and you make it your own. So in a way, it's like a vision board or um, you know a mood board or or a bright future. You know that kind of concept that we're used to. That's what an altar is. It's our bright future of enlightenment. And so if we build it, they will come. <laughs> uh, now, uh, Geshe Zopa and um, Punsok Rinpoche, when they came to visit, they said it's really important that um, if you get items from the op shop to, uh, or antiques, to bless them. So to bless them with the uh, mantra of dependent arising, because if they're antiques, um, you know, the, 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 the spirits, the people who've died, they may still be attached to them. And it, that really, it's still theirs. So we have something that's somebody else's. Or it might be something that actually belongs to the indigenous people of the land. So if we have something that's not ours in our house, it's going to cause a lot of obstacles for us. Depression, anxiety, inability to study. So you bless by reciting this mantra of dependent arising three times. And then it frees whatever attachments those beings have. Then we're not taking that which isn't freely given. Also for an altar, it's better to have something um, clean <laughs> rather than antique looking. Um, so we can have a little altar. Here's a reliquary, uh, you know, the Tibetan people, traditionally nomads would have this, they carried around their neck. It's only be about as big as your hand. And within it, all the holy uh, relics and blessing cords and mantras. We've got a modern version, a little pop-up altar that um, uh, I think now is like selling for about $120 on Amazon because it's out of print, but it's really handy um, for, a, for a little kind of travel altar. You can get a 1930s cabinet and paint it up really nicely. You can get a 1950s cabinet. The cocktail drinks cabinets are the best because you open them up, they've got little shelves, they've got mirrors, they've got built-in lights. They have a, a pop-down uh, tray where you can set up where the cocktail things are there. You can set up your bowls and then you pack it all away. And so if you live with people that an altar is a bit too confronting for them, then it's okay. Um, it's perfectly fine. Also, medicine cabinets are great. They're a little bit like having the, the icons, aren't they? You open them up, do you practice, close them again, everybody's happy. Try to have your altar hip height or higher. So you're looking up, not looking down. And certainly if you have your altar in your bedroom, don't have it lower than the bed or you'll be continuously falling asleep in meditation. So it should be high. We should be looking up towards it. But also something, you know, that, that you're involved with. Uh, what else? Oh, yes. So then I thought, so here's my altar because, because I have the Lungri Tungpa Center altar, the traditional one that I get to make offerings and you know, build up for pujas and things like that. My altar at home is very, very basic and it's a radial altar. So in the middle here is this statue that Lama Zopra Rinpoche gave me. And then out radiating from that, Chen Rezig, my kitchen fairy, the Virgin Mary in a 3D postcard. Then, then radiating out the, the Lamrim text um, and some stupas, nice lovely skull someone gave me to remember impermanence, radiating upwards, the ashes of my dead mum, my mum with Lama Zopa Rinpoche, um, the teacup she drank her coffee from. So it kind of all radiates out from this statue of um, Amitabha. And so my offerings that I've got is French perfume because I love perfume. I don't have offering bowls or anything, but um, but I've got lots of perfumes to offer. <laughs> and all the rest of the books, you know, in the in the house there, uh, just on the shelves, but the altar at least has this glass cabinet door. So I am kind of showing respect, but it's a very informal altar. Um, and, you know, that's just how it is. Here's another one. I, I was making some little altar vignettes. I uh, got these domes from Ikea. Do you have Ikea in America? I'm not sure. Anyway, um, so here's pink Zambala land. So I got a, a Zambala statue and all these little cakes and sweeties and 
um, little bottles of Chianti and some mermaid and this beautiful perfume bottle with French perfume in it, hand blown glass, all pink like the treasure vase. So we've got about six or seven of these. And when um, Venahor Rabina um, taught online for us, then I'd offer these to her on each session instead of the mandala. So, you know, this, this is my work in progress, little mini altars. Now, a little bit about the texts. So the Tibetan texts here, uh, you'll, th these are like little library cards. If you flip the, uh, the brocade up, it'll have the writing of what text it is. And generally, for a, to be a Dharma center, a fully fledged Dharma center, you need a copy of the, Tengu, the Kangyur and Tengyur, which is the 84,000 teachings of the Buddha and the commentaries. So whether they're like this, in the Tibetan Pecha form, loose leaf, or whether it's all just burnt onto a microfilm or a, or a CD or a DVD. Um, if you have the Kangyur and Tengyur, then, then it's all the teachings of the Buddha there is like representing the Dharma jewel. It's really amazing. It's a holy object. And remember that the teachings of the Buddha, there's the textual basis, the physical basis, but what they actually represent is the wisdom, the, the, the teachings. And so we can imagine the letters or the words in these books like this, three-dimensional, made of light, like neon, but soft. And it's actually the subtle body of a Buddha. It's the Sambhogakaya aspect of a Buddha. So these words are living. They're like the most subtle living form of a Buddha. They're the equivalent of like when we have the periodic table and we have H2O or carbon or whatever. Um, that's like the seed syllables of, of chemistry. This is the seed syllables of compassion. So when we look at these texts, we can think all the words, they're alive, they're made of light, they're three-dimensional. They're all singing their own sound in harmony, like the harmony of the spheres. So every time you bow down, wow, 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 what a blessing. Then the stupas, so there's the eight great stupas, all different types. These are in your notes. The stupa um, has this uh, resonance with the, with the body of a Buddha. The uh, proportions all mean something. Every little step and everything on here means something. So just to give you an idea, down the bottom here, the three steps, the three jewels of refuge. Uh, these four steps, or sometimes um, the, the, the four lotuses, represent the four immeasurables. Up here, the grounds and paths. Um, you know, up the top, the wisdom and compassion, the sun and the moon. So actually, the entire teachings on the path to enlightenment are here, uh, represented in a stupa. The... the, the, the architectural expression of a Buddha's mind. So this stupa apparently is called the, the great stupa Dharmakaya, which liberates upon seeing. So that's the, the architectural drawing of it. Here's an example, a drop dead gorgeous example. So this is um, at Copan in Nepal. Um, so one of them is Geshe Lama Konchog stupa and the other is Lama Lundrup stupa. And again, you can see it's all in the framing, isn't it? Just the magnificence, it moves the mind, it touches us. So it's kind of like using the power of, um, of exposure or advertising for good rather than evil, you know, so that we, we have these imprints that go right to our subtle mind. Then... Uh, on the left here, we've got um, the stupa at Lungri Tunka Centre, and it's on a, a, a wooden podium on wheels, so we can wheel it out so we can circumambulate around it. So that's actually got the ashes of my dead mum in it, into stupa, and is all gold leafed. Um, you can kind of see there's a little picture there of, uh, of Inta, a little story about it, and then there's room to put offerings all the way around. Uh, this stupa on the right, um, is I think it's Aptos House, Lama Zorapurimpache's house. And um, so the stupa, then the 21 Taras, oh my gosh, like they obviously have a great big 
party and chat to Rinpoche every day. And then all the bowls, the beautiful um, pools of calm to offer. And then you can circumambulate. So, of course, Rinpoche says, have an altar wherever you can, every room of the house. Um, in an office, have it so that you can circumambulate when you're on the phone. You can make merit when you're doing all of those tedious things. So um, actually, I'll tell you a story. So, you know, the altar vignette of my Zambala, pink Zambala land, how I got the perfume bottle in there. I was in Sydney and um, I'm always attracted to a shop with a bit of bling, you know, glitter, glitter. So I found this amazing looking jewellery shop and things. I was like, oh, what's in there? And I went in and they had these incredible hand-blown uh, perfume bottles. Uh, and so I'm asking about the perfume bottle and the person at the counter goes, oh, are you Miffy? <laughs> what? And uh, they said, oh, yeah, I've, I've seen you. Uh, you know, I work at the Great Stripper in Bendigo and I've seen you at Lama's Oprah and Boucher's retreat. I'm like, oh, okay, so this is a good sign, right, for, the, for getting the perfume bottle for Zambala. Um, and what I noticed, what they had in the shop, all the beautiful jewels and watches and whatever and the cabinets around and in the middle and on the top of the cabinet, so the cabinet's, you know, six foot tall, on the top of the cabinet, they had a stupa. So that everybody that came into that shop without even knowing it, circumambulated the stupa as they're looking at the bling. It's so fantastic. So of course I bought the bottle on the spot, even though it's incredibly expensive, because what skillful means is that. All right. So then the last little bit, just to blow your minds, <laughs> what goes in the stupas? So what goes in the stupas is actually the holy relics. If, if you have a stupa at home, um, if you have a holy relic, please, please put it in there. Otherwise, if you have a stupa at home, you put in, say, Tibetan medicine or precious pills or um, your old blessing strings you can put in there um, or precious jewellery. So something really precious to go inside the stupa. But the holy relics, um, actually what a, what a stupa is, when the, when the Buddha passed into Paranavana, when the Buddha's, you know, left his body, um, left the Namanakaya form, uh, he said, I'll leave holy relics so that wherever these relics are, there I am. So you never have to be without me. And so those holy relics, I think, were divided up into 84,000 relics that were spread throughout the eight great relics that went to the eight pilgrimage sites um, and then spread out th throughout the world. And so pretty much, you know, most Dharma centers have a holy relic either of the Buddha or of our incredible holy teachers, Lama Yeshi or, you know, from all these different lineages. So there are three types of relics. So one type of relic is like the bowl, the begging bowl or the robes or the bell and doji or something, you know, the mala of that great practitioner, that great saint. So that's one form of relic and it's really precious to have something like that. The other kind of relic that, that we normally think about is just like the, the, the bones or the hair um, of, of a deceased master, saint, practitioner, the remains. Um, but Buddhist holy relics also have this third type called rigsul. And so what's inside these little tiny glass stupas, let's have an aerial view, are these. So these holy relics, are found in the ashes after the cremation of the body. They're spontaneously appearing. So, you know, they're round, a little bit like pearls here. Um, here is the, um, the, the five wisdoms aggregates. Um, here, lots and lots and lots of tiny little relics with saffron in there. Um, and so all of these different spontaneously appearing substances, I know Geshe Lama Konchog, his hair relic um, was like black sh shards of hair that turned into diamond. Um, so these are really incredible. And when they, when the, when they first open up the ashes of the, um, after the cremation, they are soft. 
and there's this special thing to do where where you cover them and and after a few hours they they harden otherwise they just disintegrate into the ashes so i, I um one of, one of the monks was saying uh, uh maybe it was with geshe rabton i'm not sure one of the geshes when he passed away and they opened it up and there were the holy relics there in the ashes and they all went to grab them and they just disintegrated and so then they quickly got on the phone to some lava and went, oh, no, what do we do? And he said, stop everything, um, close everything up again, and more grew. So like 12 hours later, there were other relics there. And then there's this special ceremony, um, how to preserve them. It's, it's not just famous practitioners, but here in Brisbane, um, one of the the old Vietnamese refugees, when she passed away, they found relics in the crematorium, uh, but they didn't know what they were. Through the strength and prayers and the devotion and the virtue of the disciples, these relics multiply, which is the other thing. So when the holy relics um, were touring throughout the world and throughout Australia, whenever they would pack them up from you know, being displayed, they'd count them. And, you know, sometimes here, you know, there's four, maybe at the end of the 10 days of the exhibition, there's six or eight. You know, they, they continuously grow. They're very extraordinary. And if you go into the, if you're in the presence of these, you really feel different. So it's not to do with, um, with belief. I mean, animals are completely pacified. People from all religions are com completely moved. And I know when um, when Lama Zoprimbache came to Chen Rezik Institute, and uh, and and I didn't know, but he brought the tray of the relics in right to the back of the gompa, and my 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 eyes were just drawn, you know, two hundred meters over there, just went, wow, what's that? And I, and I thought it was because it was the bling, <laughs> but it wasn't. It that was just somehow I was able to connect and really feel something. So when you go into a Dharma center and you just cast your gaze and do a little bow to the altar, think there's probably a holy relic there that you're also creating mountains of merit. So, you know, all the Buddhas, the countless forms of the Buddhas that are there, uh, it's not so hard to bring our mind to the presence of the Buddhas when we have an altar. And last little picture is holiness you know beautiful altar here very simple the light offerings the water bowl offerings the photos of the gurus the statue the texts buddha in the middle lama Tsongkhapa, the gurus in front you know everything's there it's so beautiful so uh i hope that you feel a little bit more um inspired and confident <laughs> to build your own altar and kind of enter into this adventure. Uh, so I'd like to, um, we, can, we can have some questions now, question and answer. Um, please turn your cameras on um, if you want to ask in person and then you can wave at me and I can just say, you know, yes, yes, yes. Um, or put something into the chat if you're shy, if you're lurking in the back of the room and don't want anyone to know you're there, put something into the chat. Um, at least let me know who already has an altar. Which one of you has an altar? Um, oh, okay, you want to be woohoo, just about everybody. And um, so what stood out for you today? What stood out for you about, you know, this discussion about altars? Anything anyone would like to say, just wave at me. Oh, okay, so let's have... Um, Let's have Pauline. Oh, Pauline, go can, for it. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, I've got a question. Where do you place flowers, uh, the fake flowers, if you're putting them on the altar? Left or uh, right? Floor just, or? It's just an aesthetic thing. So wherever yep. you like, wherever it's going to work. Someone yep. was asking me. And the mantra for dependent arising is that in our gold prayer book as well yes it is it's right at the beginning and it's part of the speech blessing so when we do our daily speech blessing um oh, yeah. the it's like the ali kali which is you know the alphabet okay. and then 
um, and then the so you know the vowels, the consonants, and then the mantle dependent arising. So that's the blue mantle. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you very much. And um, let's see, Mary, did you have a question? I did. Um, I was. I didn't know anything about the radiating altar, so I learned something new. So that was I, really. I, I, I just made that up. So that's just my opinion. That's not not a kosher altar, but I think it's perfectly okay to do if that's you know if you're more like a mind map kind of person, it's going to resonate with you. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. It was beautiful. Thank you. Uh, who else? Francisca, you had a question. <clears throat> yeah, I have an antique dressing table that I use as my altar, but right smack in the middle, it's got a, a mirror. So I haven't done anything with it yet because I don't know what to do with it. And I sit there and I look at myself and I'm thinking, well, this isn't right, you know, so. Yeah, I think, um, I, see I've if you can get those gold that. doilies. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you can get them from like um, a, a, a craft shop, a spotlight or a wedding shop. And so what they do, they're a little bit like, uh, they have that effect like Russian icons of kind of having the, the halo, the offering gold, and you still get the light and the reflection from the mirror in the, in the spaces. So that kind of makes it less confronting. Not that I don't like how I look, but... <laughs> I'm not, I'm not supposed to be meditating on my image. Mere appearance. And actually you could use that as a as a thing to go, mere appearance merely appears like this. But actually what you're looking at is the Buddha statue, which is your future. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else with a question or a comment? Um, what about oh yes, Charmaine, Charmaine. So what I really, what I really admire, which is not sort of how I operate, is that you're so free. You're like so <laughs> easy and free to just create. Like the the pink Zambala land really tripped my mind out. I mean, you even had like little, um, what do you call it, macaroons? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So, <laughs> so I'm mean, I mean, wondering about how you how you advise people, like, because I I feel like. Um, we try to be really good girls and good boys and perfect Buddhists. And, but what I really admired was that what you did seemed like it really grabbed the essence of making offerings, but yeah. it was such an expression of who you are. And how, how do you kind of um, invite people to do that at your center? Well, um, that is an excellent question. And I, I, I might appear free, but I tell you what, it comes from um, a lot of consternation and years and years of anxiety. And so this was one of my central questions, not just with an altar, but say leading meditation. How do you know, um, how do you know, and I asked Lama Zopa Rinpoche this in, in person up at Chenrezig Institute, if you're being really devoted or you're totally insane. So how can you tell the difference? And Lama Zoprimache gave this incredible answer, which was everything comes from the Dharmakaya. It's there in the Dharmakaya. So, so not to worry, number one. And number two, check with the Dharma. So that's been my guiding principle and it's given me a lot of courage because I too have been very um, worried. I didn't want to stuff up. I didn't want to create negative karma but also it's too tight. And us Westerners, we're way too tight and judgmental and we forget about, this is fun. This is actually the most fun we'll ever have in life. It's where the, the biggest fun happens. Everything else is boring. So how do we have the courage? Check with the Dharma. So, so with Pink Zambala land, I'm sure there's a Pink Zambala out there somewhere, probably a little bit you know, of a left of center practice but I'm sure there's there because, you know, one day my, my mother was painting Bhaji Yagini and she painted her white pink and just went somehow, you know, and then years later she found out there is a white Bhaji Yagini. So, you know, no doubt there are more Buddhas than there are sentient beings. There's a pink Zambala out there somewhere and I've made that connection. So then you just, you check with the Dharma then 
you know, are you being respectful? Is it a is it a, a, a true reflection of Dharma, of the Dharma wisdom? But you have the courage to do it. So you can negotiate your way through that way. And because an altar is a living practice, if you go out on a limb and it's not right, you're going through the process of learning that. And so you might be, you might have some weird and wonderful things on your altar for a few weeks or a few months, and then wake up one day and go, that's not right. And that's because you've gone through a process and changed. So that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, what else? Anyone else have any? Oh, yes, Doris. You're so fun. <laughs> Are there some things that we should not have on our altars? Uh, yeah, don't offer cans of tuna. Don't, don't offer the, the bodies of sentient beings. I mean, that's quite tricky because, you know, if people come and they, they donate things to be offered and sometimes we have, we had, you know, some, some, some tuna things. So don't do that. Don't, um, don't offer anything poisonous. So no, no poisonous flowers, for instance. Um, and if you offer roses, then uh, take the, the spines off the little, so that it's not sharp things. And of course, and we'll talk more about this next week, but um, you know, when, when we're making offerings, we don't, if we're, if we're offering say biscuits, we don't offer the boring ones to Buddha and keep the good ones for ourselves. <laughs> or if you're going out shopping and you're buying all these treats and things and you go, I'm well, going to, I'm going to save these ones for the visitors important visitors coming and i'll offer these ones to the buddha that everything the very best goes to the buddha then half an hour later you take it away and offer it to whoever you like um try and try and keep everything um clean so you, if, for those of you who've seen that fantastic movie the little buddha um so in that, I mean, it's a, it's a great story and it's actually really interesting in terms of reincarnation and the three bodies of a Buddha um, and the body, speech and mind of a Buddha. It's really, really worth seeing. It, it might feel a little bit like a kid's movie, but it's not. But in there, you'll notice there's a Tibetan Lama, an actual Tibetan Lama that, you know, uh, is one of the stars of the movie and the kid goes and visits. And in the background, you'll see his altar and, uh, and a tanka exquisite tanka behind and the tanka is wrapped in glad wrap <laughs> and so i mean that's what the tibetans do when they came out to the west and you know they have all their offerings with the with the butter lamps and stuff their soot goes everywhere so when they came to the west they discovered glad wrap and they just wrapped everything that was precious in glad wrap <laughs> geshe tashi sering when he was at chenrezi institute as well he had his offering goddess wrapped in, <laughs> in glad wrap it was just like, what kind of aesthetics is that? But it shows, it shows the importance of, of, of cleanliness. So if we keep our altar clean, it helps to get rid of the cobwebs in our own mind. And if our altars got really dusty, we know we've been neglecting something within our inner world. So you just kind of, that's why I said it's like a biofeedback that rather than being judgmental about your altar, you can just kind of gauge where you're up to and notice, oh, my energy must be pretty low or oh, I must be quite distracted because of the state of my altar. And then, then you just do something about it. It's okay. What else? Anybody else? Uh, yes, Mary. I, I missed what you said about um, using the dependent arising mantra for antiques, but I admit I, something I must have not heard correctly. What antiques would go on the altar? Oh, so antiques, if the, the altar itself like comes from the op shop, like the cabinet, the 1950s drinks cabinet, but also um, if you get say beautiful vases to put your flowers in and they're antique vases, or I get a lot of our offering bowls from the op shop. Now the Tibetans don't like that because they don't like secondhand things. But I mean, I love secondhand things because they're beautiful, but there's a lot of um, stickiness with them. So to consecrate them or bless them with the, with the mantra dependent arising clears everything. Um, but that's just a really good general thing too. If you, if you bring anything home from outside from, from a shop, 
um, from a pawn shop, for instance, you get lots of beautiful little offerings from a pawn shop and they've definitely got a history. So it, it releases the beings that are still clinging to it that, that can't let go. And, um, and a lot of, uh, also, if you've ever been camping and you brought a stone back from the place or you've brought, you know, um, in particular, those things from nature, uh, which you may have taken something from um, a nature spirit or a naga, then if you bring them into your home, um, you, you'll have disturbances. So there's all this stuff going on that, you know, we, we can just make life easier for ourselves by just saying that mantra over everything. <laughs> Oh, yes, Pauline, right, there you go. There's the stone in question. So you've got some homework to do. <laughs> what else? Is there any um, other mysteries of what goes on an altar or something or that you've seen at one of your Dharma centres that you're wondering what it was or seen online? No, what else? Oh, yes, other Mary. <laughs> Thank you so much, Miffy. This is so inspiring. Um, quick question. Do you set out the tantric level, the tantric offerings daily or just just when you're doing puja? Uh, it depends if you if you have a daily practice. So um, for our altar, we just have the water bowls. My mother, her altar just had the tantric offering bowls, but that's because she did tantric offerings every day. So it depends on what your practice is, but generally just start with the water bowls. But we'll, we'll go more into that next week of the whys and wherefores about it. But um, I think uh, for, for us, the, the tantric bowls are more like a pop-up thing. The, the main practice is the, is the water bowls. And with the, the statues, you know, you have the, the Buddha in the middle and then the highest yoga tantra statues in the first uh, circle and then the lower tantra statues in the second circle. So you, you'd have your highest yoga tantra statues on either side of the Buddha and then you'd have, you know, Tara, Manjushri and Chinrezik the next level around. So it can be either next to each other or coming down lower with steps. So a lot of those cabinets, they're great because you can make your own steps. So you'd Buddha at the top and then each of the level down and then um, either at the top or in the front, the photos of the gurus and then Lama Yeshi. So he would always have the little Tonka toys of a plane and a car on his altar. So because, you know, what did the Lamas do? But travel around the world for decades. So Lama Zoe Primbache would talk about the kindness of the aeroplane. And Geshe Tashi Sering would say, what are you talking about? It's just an airplane, it's not kind. So then they'd have this wonderful Geshe debate, you know, as they're walking up the hill. So if there's something really important to you, so important offerings like perfume, and I, I mean, I was married to a perfumer, so it's pretty important. Um, but also you can have photos, like I've got a picture of Frida Kahlo, I've got a picture of Nietzsche, because they're also my gurus. But you just have it, you make sure that somehow you reflect the hierarchy so that nothing's higher than the guru, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, and then everything else around it. Um, traditional altars actually would have all of the texts along the top. So if your altar's in a bookcase, it's very easy because you have Dharma texts on the top, then you have the Buddha statues, then the shelf underneath you have your offering bowls, and then down the bottom, the cupboard, all the consumables. So that can work quite nicely. Otherwise, at least with the Dharma books, have them separate from the ordinary books because, you know, they, the results from the Dharma books are so different from ordinary books. So we've got to have the, the physical expression of that reflects it. So um, it's it's just on, oh, Francesca, last question. Yes. Now, you were talking about putting relics and things into stupas, but I have a, a solid stupa that I can't put anything into. Um, so how do I manage that with my, say, blessing strings and Tibetan medicine that I've got left over that I don't uh, want to throw away? 
you, you can put them in a little box that goes under the stupa. And often if you have someone's ashes that have been, um, you know, cleansed by the llama, they go in a little box under the stupa um, or next to it. So that's okay. Nice little box, something pretty. Um, a lot of the stupas, yeah, are solid. So that's okay. That traditionally though, they were made um, hollow. So you can put those holy objects in, but in the vicinity will do. So just a little quick dedication then. So let's dedicate all of our um, efforts of coming today and concentrating uh, and um, so, so the energy that you put in and your good heartedness. Uh, let's dedicate that we can actually build a, a, a pure environment so that we can, we can, by creating this outer environment and creating an altar, we can, we can kind of reveal that pure environment in our mind that potential. Let's dedicate that we can be um, inspired in this way by the three jewels and actually open ourselves up to the help and the inspiration of the three jewels by using this real divine form of advertising. Um, let's dedicate that we can create a sacred space for ourselves and for others so that our, our house, our altar can become a place of refuge for everybody else that we're responsible for in our life. Um, and by doing all of this, may we actually uh, become a Buddha. May, may, may that reflection come into reality um, sooner rather than later, uh, so that when we become a Buddha and actually do the activities of a Buddha, then we can perfectly help all beings. So thank you. Enjoy. Go forth and experiment. <laughs>